trying a new format for today's webinar, which we hope will be entertaining and a nice break from the traditional webinar format. We're going to start with a brief state of the sports nutrition and healthy lifestyle industry overview. We're following that with a speed round in which each of our panelists are going to give us their key takeaways based on their own perspectives of the market. And then we're going to go into a panel discussion. And I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who answered our pre-event survey and provided us with questions for the panel discussion. We got some great questions. So uh, we'll be using those in the panel discussion. And thank you very much. Um, and then at the end, we're going to wrap up with some live Q&A. Our presenters today our panelists are Alice, Corbin, and Nikki. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves as they join us and um let's see i'm going to go to our next slide here so nikki i'm going to hand it off to you for our introduction to the um for our state of the sports and nutrition healthy lifestyle market and um can you introduce yourself as well yeah thank you moira so my name is Nikki Kennedy. I have worked at Glambia for over 10 years. And right now I am responsible, responsible for category insights in sports nutrition and supplements. I'm really excited to sort of kick off this new format and see that there are you know, people willing to participate in something a little bit different. You know, many of us are in a new era of work. Work feels a bit different. Work sounds a lot different everything from video customer meetings to online trade shows and booths to maybe slightly less patient canine or adolescent co-workers. And in order to keep ourselves sane, many of us are also redefining how we work out. So today we wanted to spend some time discussing the evolution of working out and working out from home. This has been forced by a global pandemic um, and its potential effects that both temporarily and long term to what sports nutrition, lifestyle nutrition, nutrition, active nutrition, you know, however you or your company refers to or defines it. What is what kind of effect could this have on the long term? So I'm going to be throwing out a variety of stats from a lot of different sources, but I'm going to keep referring back to Glambia Nutritional's own ongoing COVID survey. The GN primary research team started this survey in early March, and it's from a gen pop US consumer base, and they've continued to track results up until now. A very, very special thank you to Emily Halleck, which some of you may remember if you attended this year's Megatrend webinar. She put a survey into the field this week and got us results. They are the freshest data you can possibly have. So special thank you to her. Let's set the scene here. And I want to start by talking about the most sort of relevant stat that I have personally followed in all of that data. And it's when do consumers think we're going to get back to normal? And it appears that we are becoming a little less optimistic about that. So about 30% of consumers say that 2021 at the earliest is when we'll get back to normal. And another 33% say that not before the summer of 2021. And I think this data obviously shows a potential effect on what we've seen in terms of the home gym boom. Now, I did a really sort of simple search just looking at Google trend analysis. And I was looking at the term home gym, and I found that it skyrocketed in the second week of March, peaked off at the beginning of April, and its relevancy has slowly crawled back down, but it's remained a lot higher than pre-COVID levels. I did the same search for Peloton. It follows a very similar pattern in terms of Google Trends, although since it's a much more specific term, it doesn't get quite as high in terms of relevancy. Another indication is what these companies are reporting. So when we look at home gym equipment sales, they have increased significantly. Peloton reported a 172% sales surge, and also that they have more than 1 million people subscribing to their streaming classes. Nordic Track also reported high increases, 200% on the previous year in March, and up to 600% in May. So I just want to take a quick poll here to see what kind of group we have on this, um, on this webinar, I suppose, and if it compares to what we've seen in our results. So if you guys don't mind taking this quick poll here, um, what's your experience 
Ben, have you purchased exercise equipment to work out at home, like a treadmill or a spin bike, or maybe weightlifting if you kitted out your garage with a weightlifting set? Did you purchase an accessory, so a uh, resistance band or maybe a yoga mat? Did you not purchase at all because you were already working out at home? Or did you not purchase at all because working out at home just, you know, it isn't your jam? So I'll give just a quick minute here. Okay, looks like we have most responses. <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to fit to figure out. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so this looks a little bit like what we saw. Um, it's slightly higher. So we found that a lot of you are working out, or maybe we're already working out at home slightly higher than the general population. So our survey results showed that 22% of US consumers indicated that they had purchased extra exercise equipment at home since the pandemic. Some already had some and some just added to it, but that number combined came to 22%. While a further 20% indicated that they already had stuff at home, so they didn't need to purchase anything. So our results here were you know, slightly higher. The most common uh, purchased the most common type of equipment purchased uh, was cardio equipment, like a treadmill or a spin bike, followed by weightlifting equipment. And those were the most two common that people already had at home as well. Now, a lot of this equipment is quite expensive. So we see that a good chunk of US consumers have made a long-term investment, but how does this affect their new routine? Our COVID survey indicates that just over half of US active consumers are working out at home, similar to what we saw in terms of purchases, which with between 35 and 45% of consumers working out outdoors. Now I gave a range because obviously with the weather, there's different trends happening here. This number trended higher in the spring and summer, but with winter weather on the horizon, we expect that these numbers should trend back down and maybe even go to the lower end of that. Now, I do want to make a point here that just like the sports nutrition product landscape, the demographics and activities of an active consumer or what we're kind of tracking here is very diverse. Now, if we're speaking very, very generally, and I say this very generally, um, because we've looked at a combination of our own data and some external information, but generally it appears that hardcore performance athletes, they maybe went a little bit harder or quickly to move, while as maybe active lifestyle folks like myself, they took it a little bit easy, maybe drag their feet a little bit. Um, these are general, you know, general assumptions here, but they are supported by some data that we have, that there's been a divergence of consumers who between who have indicated that they are or are not working out. So what we found is that the number of consumers who indicated they are not working out has gone up but so has the number of consumers who indicate they are working out more frequently, so kind of a split. Um, I have two assumptions on what's happening here. First of all, you know, the high performance dedicated athletes, they moved quickly to build their home gyms or they already had them. And they maybe find that they're a little bit more convenient and maybe used a bit more than what they were when they were going to an actual gym. Also, we all have a little bit more time. So it's a little bit easier to find time to work out um, or go for a walk, et cetera. For those consumers, now I think there is a group out there of consumers who may have been a bit slower to adopt. So they were more recreationally working out, maybe they only worked out in classes, and they found it a bit harder to incorporate working out in their adjusted routine. And that's why we're sort of seeing this split. Now, what we do know is that consumers are still engaged with performance nutrition and sort of their overall well being when it comes to their nutritional choices. In our most recent COVID survey, more than 30% of consumers who were using an RTM or protein bars indicated that they had increased their consumption from the last week. And at least one in four consumers indicated that they had increased their consumption of protein RTDs. So the consumption drive is there, but what we're seeing change are usage occasions. About one in three consumers of protein fortified bars and beverages, both powder and RTD, indicate that their reason for consumption has changed due to COVID. So while many people who would have kept bars in their desk or maybe taken an RTD shake on the train on the way to work, they're not commuting anymore. So they're not really having those occasions to use them. 
you know, the commute from the gym in your basement to your kitchen table doesn't require the same kind of an on-the-go convenience that so many products and brands did a great job innovating around. You know, with any luck, these on-the-go occasions will see a resurgence, but in the meantime, and potentially for many consumers whose routine may be altered forever, reframing of occasions and adapting products, I think will be a huge benefit to both brands and consumers. So that's the brand and consumer side, but I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit more about products and functional ingredients for a quick second, because that's really the bread and butter of today's discussion and what the bulk of, will be of what we'll be talking about today. As I just mentioned, consumers are still looking for protein fortified products, and we'll talk a lot more about that. But I think the biggest trend we're seeing is around immunity. Pre-COVID consumer data already indicated an inclination of those hardcore performance athletes to supplement with key vitamins, minerals, and other micronutrients to support their performance. Even more so than those, what we would call active consumers or healthy lifestyle consumers. Going forward, all indications are that immunity and immune health benefits are gonna to come to the forefront across the board in nutrition. So we can only assume that performance and active consumers will be just as engaged in this area, if not more. And my last point on immunity is on some ingredient indications that we've found. So a few things are happening globally. I think everyone is aware of the jump in immune supplements, and we found that it's really those key nutrients that consumers are relying on, the standard multivitamins, and now particularly vitamin D has seen a spike in consumer indication use for immunity. Additionally, in post-COVID surveys created by FMCG gurus, globally, we see that there is an immune association with protein, just that general term, protein. And I believe it has a lot to do with the logic that protein is good for my health, and if I'm healthy, my immune system is functioning well. However, this is where my knowledge ends. So I'm now gonna pass the discussion on to the real brains of the operation around here. Um, so Corbin and Alice are gonna kick off our speed rounds. All right, awesome. So yep, for, for the speed round, I think Alice, you are up first. You wanna introduce yourself as well? Sure. Can can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. So this is Alice <laughs> Wilkinson. I'm a food scientist here with Glambia. I um, traditionally have worked as a food scientist for Watson, and now I'm uh, helping with our premix teams globally for the nutrition um, division within Glambia, and that includes our uh, functionally optimized nutrients as well as our multi-component premixes. Um, so, I'm in charge of my own slides, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, in regards to what can we do to stay healthy, you know, really talking around our overall health and immunity, to me, um, this was really where we came around to what can I do to just stay healthy. So, very, very um, basic things like like Nikki just remember, uh, mentioned around multivitamins, you know, people looking for vitamin D, vitamin C. I had a lot of inquiries even here around the office. What should I be doing? How can I stay healthy? And what can I do or, or have control of to keep myself healthy during these times? And, um, and that overall health, uh, overall health and immunity really kind of drove through at the very beginning of this. And I still have a lot of inquiries around that. Uh, both from our customers as well as on a one-to-one -one basis. So, and then a lot of this would be back to the basics. You know, what do I what do I already know as a, a consumer? You know, I I'm really familiar with walking, right? And and maybe we've been um, included in a step challenge or a a couch to 5K. Um, what can I do while we're in this uh, pandemic? Well, outside has always been better, right? Or what do I already have? So it may be my basement weights, right? And I might have a little routine that I can do about do by myself. Um, so then what supplements really kind of complemented this? So things along the lines of, you know, a little bit of like a pre-workout product here and there, or something maybe to support our joints or um, to, to help me if my, my back is hurting, those types of things where, you know, I am trying to stay active uh, or use this time. Uh, maybe a lot of that additional time that people had was, was trying to get outside and, and keep their immunity boosted, be out in the sunshine and breathe the fresh air. 
Uh, but that uh, additional wear and tear also, you know, brought on things like, you know, some some additional aches and pains as well. So. And then comfort first, and I think that this was really important as well. Um, in regards to where we are now, I think a lot of people reach right back into their childhood for those products that made them feel better, right? Whether that be uh, macaroni and cheese or or maybe that extra special treat. And so now where are we going to go with uh, our supplements? I think that there's maybe a little less forgiveness for things that don't taste great. Um, so they're looking for things to to be indulgent at the same time that we have a, a product that uh, is providing a lot of functionality. So those ingredients that um, that we would really like to have for the functional benefit, but they still need to to fall into that chocolate brownie or uh, cookie dough or that tasty mindset where it's uh, an indulgence as well as being a healthy product. And so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from um, into into this healthy nutrition lifestyle at the same time that we're we're trying to uh, to keep ourselves healthy from a pandemic. Awesome, thank you, Alice. Corbin, do you want to share with you share with us what your key points are, key takeaways? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Moira. A uh, quick introduction. My name is Corbin Hole. I'm also a research scientist for Glambie Nutritionals. I'm based in Twin Falls, Idaho at our innovation center. I focus mostly on uh, the bioactives team, ingredient development, clinical support, and application work focused on beverages, mostly ready to mix. Uh, and with that, we're gonna jump into my three takeaways. Um, these are gonna be focused around protein in our current situation. And the first one is gonna echo some of the uh, things that Alice and Nikki have already brought up, uh, the consumer trend of, of immunity. Um, so the consumer trend of focusing on immune health was already growing, but now it's on an accelerated path. Uh, whey proteins are really well known by consumers uh, for benefits associated with exercise, recovery, skeletal muscle tissue support. Um, but whey proteins are starting to become a bit more recognized by the general consumer for their uh, Im immunological support. Um, proteins that are high in essential amino acids like whey proteins can help support the body's immune system. Um, obviously, the immune system is a very complex system, but whey protein's high bioavailability can support the health of immune cells, for starters. Uh, there are certain fractions within whey proteins that have specific functions, uh, alpha-lactobumin and glycomacropeptide, or casein macropeptide, as it's also known. Uh, they play valuable roles in immune function. Uh, these are two major fractions within sweet whey, whey so whey from cheese make. Um, whey protein can also contain other bioactive fractions um, like lactoferrin and immunoglobulins. Uh, lactoferrin plays a number of roles, but it's part of the innate immune system, and it really is critical binding and absorbing iron and then taking that iron away from harmful bacteria in some cases, uh, so it binds it up. Um, so in review, protein is starting to be recognized and marketed by both uh, ingredient suppliers and brands for its benefits from an immune standpoint, which follows the trend uh, that Nikki mentioned. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, more around consumer usage and the difference between using protein at home versus using this away. Now, some of this data is uh, from the COVID survey, but ultimately, uh, consumers are spending significantly more time at home. We all are, uh, but still need to consume additional protein based on their goals. And if you're working out at home, you're still going to be trying to consume that extra supplemented protein. Um, what we're seeing in some of our reports is that some consumers are starting to get their protein from their local grocery store as opposed to mega stores or online. That's not to say that those are decreasing overall, but we're seeing a slight shift there. Um, my gut feeling is that many consumers are trying to mitigate the amount of stops they're making out in public, their exposure to the public, and so they're trying to get kind of a one-stop shop at their local grocery store. Um, now, RTMs remain a staple for home usage. As Nikki mentioned, we have kind of a decrease in that travel and need for convenience products. RTMs are probably the most versatile in terms of being able to use for a home shake, a quick beverage, baking, cooking. You can incorporate it into a number of different scenarios, plant-based or dairy-based, whatever the consumer is looking for. Um, many consumers are still consuming the same protein that they were consuming before, uh, just probably at a higher rate. Um, that would be their preferred protein, assuming they can find it on the shelf. Now, uh, consumers know of the benefits of protein, so they're pursuing protein for its nutrient benefits and for its healthy perception, specifically whey. Um, RTMs, like I said, continue to kind of be the most functional space there. 
so the takeaway is that consumers are using more protein at home out of necessity and out of experience. So the last point I want to talk about briefly is, uh, ooh, I double clicked, I apologize. There we go, um, body composition goals. So another thing we saw in our survey is that consumers' uh, interests have kind of shifted from pre-COVID times to current conditions uh, with increased value being placed on improving their body composition or improving their metabolism. Now, uh, participants listed diet and cardio as being the major methods to accomplish these goals. Um, so if you pair whey protein with these two uh, intervention methods, you're looking at a pretty strong response. Um, resistance training is likely reduced at home workouts. There's, you know, as Nikki mentioned again, the home gym uh, hardcore user probably got their hands on the equipment before it sold out or before the price went up, but not everybody has access to the square footage or uh, the available cash to get these goods, or maybe they were slow to the race. Um, but either way, reduced resistance training protein still plays a very functional role for home athletes pursuing diet and exercise. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that not only can whey protein help with immunity or muscle maintenance, but also satiety. Uh, whey protein isolate is obviously a very, uh, or isolates of any kind are very good uh, calorie to protein ratio for those on a caloric deficit or that are monitoring their macronutrient or calorie intake. Um, at least 90% matter, or excuse me, less, at least 90% on the dry matter basis. Then again, casein, casein macropeptide or glycomacropeptide plays a large role in suppressing ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone uh, produced in the pancreas that signals hunger. And so if you can suppress that, you can uh, essentially create satiety, reduce appetite. And if you're in a caloric deficit, that's really, really valuable. So again, to review, consumers are recognizing proteins, whey proteins for their immune benefit. They are using them at home more consistently, and they're utilizing them for their skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle and dieting uh, benefits as well. And those are my major takeaways. Awesome, thank you, Corbin. Um, Nikki, we're back to you for your top three observations. <laughs> Great, thanks, Moira. Um, and thanks, Allison Corbin, for definitely increasing the IQ of this presentation. Um, I'm gonna circle back around to a few of the more consumer-facing slides. Um, so you saw my introduction picture. I've obviously bought into this whoops, home, out, home workout routine um, sorry, guys, let me pull that backwards. Got a little too click happy. Um, so I ordered a Peloton. Unfortunately, it was assembled incorrectly and it's a little, little bit broken. And those guys are a bit busy. So that picture was, I was so excited. I took a picture in one of the five rides that I was able to pick, uh, was able to get in. But that picture you saw earlier was before. And this is a potential after a picture of me when I've given up hope in January and I'm just going to lift one pound weight. Um, so if anyone on here knows anyone in Peloton, if you could give a good word, that would be that would be great. Um, so anyway, here's my top three. Uh, they have a little bit more to do with the consumer experience with home workouts and how it some, uh, relates a little bit to nutrition, but maybe what we're looking at in the future. I mentioned usage occasions, and I think that they're changing. And I believe that this has a lot to do with the convenience factor and what that now means to consumers. Um, Pre-pandemic, uh, Hartman did a great job at really encapsulating this. So I'm I am basically using what they've put in here, but sort of reframing it around the the sports nutrition aspect. Um, you know, if we're talking about formats, if you're not talking about you know the protein, the ingredients, the performance, if you're looking just at format, I don't think right now consumers are looking for that easy, quick accessible. I don't think that's driving usage, but more consumers are trading off easy for empowering. So I want a shortcut, but I still want to be a part of the process because I have time to be a part of the process. So thinking like protein waffle mixes. Um, and because a lot of us have gained more time, maybe quick isn't as, isn't as exciting as engaging is, you know, can I, like Corbin said, I can use my RTM in a variety of places, not just in a shake that I take um, on the go. So it gives you a little bit more space to sort of Products that do give you a little bit more space to customize, um, I think, are, are doing quite well. And then instead of a product being, you know, where you are right when you need it, I think it's more about having that flexibility, you know, filling in those gaps around usage and being functional to, to your new life. So although this wasn't created for sports nutrition, I think that this is, is a great way to start thinking about, you know, how you could potentially develop products um, with these things in mind, the experience in mind. 
Um, my next my next point, my number two, is around the acceleration of what becomes the online personality. So this was already happening pre-pandemic, and we looked at this pre-pandemic. So consumers were not only engaging online, but they were coming in through multiple entry points um, to get at that sort of brand online personality. In the US, we found that in fact, influencers are actually very influential for people who are looking at things online. But I think overall brand personality is something that should be looked at. And we did a bit of um, looking into this. So these next um, visuals that you're going to see here are for what I would call pretty similar sports nutrition brands. They obviously offer a wide variety of um, products, but they're more focused on uh, performance than they were on lifestyle. And what I'm deeming personality here is just if I looked at the general grouping of terms what did they kind of jump out at me but what I found that like what people are saying about these products online the things that they're being associated with they can vary quite a bit from you know an activity focus and motivation or is it more of an emotion connection to the product or maybe it's just about the products and people have a really strong you know uh, connection to that I mean I think the point really here that I'm making is that online personality has become a much larger aspect in consumer interactions so making sure that your brand's personality aligns to the consumer that you're trying to target became a much bigger thing in a much faster um, amount of time and it was kind of difficult to decide on my third topic because I do think there is a huge opportunity to appeal to the more mental and cognitive aspect of active consumers, especially now, you know, we're at a time when so many people are looking into home exercise as a stress management tool, but I decided to go with um, e-athletes for a few reasons. Let me see. And there we go. Too quick. Let's see. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> this is my. There we go. So I went with e athletes for three reasons. Number one, the industry is pandemic proof. Obviously, esports events suffered, but if you think about the awareness that physical athletes brought to esports in the early days, I think it's made a real pan, uh, a real real impact. Number two, this group includes a lot more people than young teenage boys alone in their room, which I think is the stereotype. It's changing, but I think that's what a lot of people think. Looking at the demographics um, of the age ranges here, it's quite, uh, it's quite spread out. And I think that another thing that has sort of surprised me is the gender identification, identification within this sort of niche product area is pretty evenly split. And they're not alone in their rooms anymore. You know, the, the major thing that I'm sort of learning about this area is the connectivity aspect um, of gaming that is today. 65% of people who play games say that they're playing with others, either competing online with friends or, you know, they might be playing with someone else in, in their house. And that kind of leads me to the, the last aspect on why I went with this um, is that I think more quickly than we realize the, the competitive and performance aspect of this is going to grow, and it's going to grow even beyond sort of the big tent esport events of today. And I expect that, like a lot, a lot of you know non-professional athletes, high school kids, college kids, people who are just doing this as a hobby, the everyday gamer is going to probably start looking to beat the person that's on the other side of the game. And so there will be a performance aspect associated to energy focus and eye health and you know the the ingredients that are associated with those things are pretty standard you know people are aware of their effects um you know look to wrap up i i really think that gaming is evolving extremely quickly and i'll go out on a limb and make a prediction that e-athletes will very quickly be looking at the more physical aspect to gaming you know Virtual reality is going to get some gamers off their couches and that sort of marriage of the physical and the cognitive together, I think is not only going to be powerful in the physical aspect space, but the e-gamer space as well. So that's my top three. And I think we kick it over to the panel discussion now. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got our great panel questions again. Thank you to our audience for giving us these great questions. Um, and basically how we're going to run this part is that all of the panelists are just going to um, chime in here. 
So our first question is, what are the most challenging aspects of sports nutrition formulating? Alice, do you like to lead off? I could. Yeah, so really, I think that um, there's some really fabulous ingredients out there that we know of in regards to sports nutrition. Um, and they've got excellent clinical data. It might be things that we've seen in the past. There's some new products coming out as well. Um, but sometimes there's some real issues trying to get uh, uh, efficacy out of them or effective dose into what we're actually trying to market to our consumer. And that can, you know, arise with some, some pretty hard issues. You know, things like, I really like this ingredient. The clinical data is, you know, top notch, exactly what I want to use. But um, we have issues with flavor or uh, there's an odor issue or the color of my product is not um, what I was intending. Or maybe the product's physically not compatible anymore. I can't get any stability out of it. I was working in a gummy and, and I couldn't uh, uh, succumb the issues around gelation. Um, so those those things all kind of come into play. You know, we, we have these great ingredients, but they can't just be a good ingredient on their own unless we're going to be putting them into something that's a single swallow like a tablet. Um, and even there, it's got to be the dose has got to be right. So those new challenges are also something that I think uh, helps our industry quite a bit, right? So we are starting to see these new formats where we have something as a, a real small dose ready to drink or a powder add-on or gummies. But um, the, the fact that we have these new formats, it's really great that our consumers want to kind of start with them first. They tend to be the early adopters on these things, um, but they do provide more challenges for us as food formulators because um, lots of times we do have a much smaller window to work in. It's much more difficult to put something in a sprinkle powder than it is into a regular ready to mix where I might have you know, 30 or 40 grams of product to be working with. So those flavors become even further concentrated, uh, off reactions are even further um, enhanced and so it just is another big challenge for us um, and you know color can also be an issue you know this move to kind of these more clear based beverage where we're worried moving away from kind of the traditional ready to drink you know what, what does that do with the other components that we were hiding in there behind all of that that traditional dairy protein and uh, that can cause some extensive work for us as well so that's kind of one of the, the big challenges that I see in regards to our formulations. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that and say as a, as a, you know, as a formulator and a developer as well, uh, flavor and stability are probably the two most challenging aspects for sure, and that's probably not going to change. There's a pretty strong push for, um, for you know, natural plant-based solutions in many cases, um, and, and some of those really do bring some, some flavor and stability challenges. Uh, likely due to insolubility um, and so you know we're working closely with our own flavor house glamby nutritional flavor house and other flavor uh, suppliers and stability suppliers to uh, or excuse me um, uh, gum and, and stability suppliers to uh, to deliver on that depending on the application okay great good answers um so our next question is how is the dairy market for sports nutrition doing um with the increase of plant-based products? Yeah, I'll, I'll actually jump off on this one. Um, so we do know that, you know, pre-pandemic and even, you know, still today, plant-based proteins are getting a lot of attention. And I do expect this to continue. You know, healthy diet is going to come back to the forefront. Um, and many consumers, you know, we, we do think do tend to look at plant-based products and they do so for health reasons. Um, environmental concerns and sustainability concerns aren't going to go away either. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, dairy still dominates, especially in the U.S., dairy still dominates the protein space in terms of performance and lifestyle. Um, that's from consumer appeal to product launches to retail sales, you know, in the U.S., multiple consumer attitude and behavior studies globally and in the U.S. indicate that milk sources, particularly whey sources, are the you know most preferred source of protein. We've done these internally. I've seen them externally. The you know it, it's it's very consistent. Dairy always holds the the top spot. And in more cases that even I am you know 
a surprise that whey protein does lead even in cases where you know whey protein isn't isn't in a lot of products um but there is certainly a preference a health halo um, around it. And one example that I always like to share in this is from primary research that Glambia Nutritionals did in January. In the US, we asked consumers, you know, if you had a protein shake, and they said they did, what was the type of protein that was in your lab? RTD, um, and the largest percent of consumers, about over 40% chose whey protein, you know, 30% indicated soy and 20% or a little over 20% indicated milk protein. And, you know, if you know the, the makeup of the market, I like I do, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at it. Those numbers just don't add up because if we're looking at the most popular types of protein RDDs, those are, those are milk proteins. Um, so it's just, it's just interesting to see this sort of the dynamics you see there. Um, like I said, plant, I think will always be around, but dairy, dairy is the dominator. I don't know, Corbin, you have a lot of experience with formulation, so. Yeah, and I think uh, the trend is following exactly as you've described. The majority we get uh, is still dairy, but there is a plant presence. Uh, it is growing, uh, but still dominated by dairy. Okay, very good. So our next question is, what's the most surprising trend you've seen relating to sports nutrition supplements? I can jump in on that. Uh, aside from the e-gamer growth that I think is, I agree with Nikki, is likely going to explode and become a, a really large new sector around cognition and uh, focus, reaction time, things like that, eye health. Um, to me, there's a lot of push for non-stimulant uh, pre-workout powders. Now, I know I saw some questions earlier about caffeine content in powdered beverages and how it can be quite high. Um, those are marketed specifically as pre-workout supplements. People are looking for a pretty strong stimulant kick in those cases, but there's a growing sector that does not want the stimulant kick. They maybe get that stimulant uh, coffee or tea or a different source, and they're just looking for a pure performance increase without uh, a caffeine hit. And that uh, non-stim pre-workout is really start to make, starting to make its presence known and taking a, a good chunk of that pre-workout pre -workout market, specifically in the sports space. So to, to lead off from that, Corbin, we have seen similar things. And there are some really excellent ingredients out there that can be used as non-stimulatory for pre-workout. Um, and again, going back to that flavor, sometimes that dose, the flavor can be a little bit of an issue. And there are some ways to, to mitigate those issues by either doing um, a complete encapsulation around those components so that we can get that efficacious dose. There's also some really great flavor maskers out there that can be um, you know, paired with the right flavor profiles to, to make it so we can get that effective dose in there. Um, but in regards to the, kind of like that daily lifestyle around sports nutrition now, I do agree with you that there's probably less of a push around that real high dose caffeine and what we would call more of like a baby pre, right? Like a, a, mm -hmm. half, a half dose, a lower dose, a non-stimulatory dose. Um, so maybe, um, you know, some of that hardcore um, user is still looking for that, you know, really high dose, like a ghost or a... Um, some of those different types of products versus kind of the, the much lower dose. And maybe that's where we see some of the split in the data mm -hmm. that Nikki was talking about, the people who are working out even more versus the people who may be doing less is that, you know, it's kind of consumers chosen to go one direction versus the other. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and mine's a little bit same, but it, it kind of digs on that uh, product. Collagen has been incredibly surprising to me. Um, you know, I just think for people who are in the sports nutrition space, sort of, they're starting to ask their, their themselves questions about, you know, what are these lifestyle consumers getting out of collagen? And the fact that it, I think, has been able to disrupt the sort of really high growth that we saw in plant, maybe it's those types of consumers that are competing, um, they're looking for maybe plant and then collagen. But that also doesn't make sense to me because if you're looking for a plant product and you're choosing a collagen, you know, the source, the sourcing might have something to do with it. Look, I, I think a lot of people are starting to turn their heads and look much more seriously at collagen's place. Um, what do consumers think about it? We get a lot of questions like that. What do consumers think about it? What are they taking it for? And the answers can be quite varied. So for me, it's been, you know, the I, I wasn't surprised to see collagen on, you know, kind of trending. I am surprised to see it sort of last this long and, and you know, build as much as it has. So that's mine. 
collagen is kind of like that new gelatin, right? From back in the yeah. 80s, mm -hmm. right? And so you've got a, a really wide variety of people taking it. You've got people taking it for joint support and you have people taking it for their wrinkles. So again, your real wide base. And I, I also think that there's not necessarily a really great correlation with some of the day-to-day -day users as to what the source is. They just right. think it's collagen. They may not even know that it's not plant-based. And so that yeah. may play into this as well. Um, and, and honestly, like with the plant-based thing, I, I think that you see, you know, an increase some, just like, like you said, around dairy being king, is that there's an increase in maybe that adding of the additional plant product, but not necessarily completely removing one or the other. So like vegan, and I saw that there were some questions around vegan and what do we think about that? I think what I see more than like a true veganism, I see have seen a lot more of that kind of like one meal a day, that reduction in consumption of animal protein and the addition of additional vegetable to the diet. And that kind of plays along with, you know, and I'm able to do that because I have more time at home or, you know, I'm going to pick, you know, if I am going to take take out, maybe I'm not going to go to like the greasy spoon diner. But, you know, it's more of a special thing. If I am taking out takeout, I want to get it from someplace that's really fresh and has more vegetable. So, yeah, I, was thinking, I think, I think that's kind of plays point. both sides of that. I don't think people necessarily understand. Yeah. And, and to follow up on that, you know, from. I saw a great presentation a couple of weeks ago, and it was about um, what they're like this new group of people who are looking at social capital and what does the social capital of protein look like? So basically, it's saying like, oh, like what if I take protein, but what makes it cool that I'm taking protein, or what am I talking about around protein? And they indicated that you know the next wave of social capital around protein, um, and this is from a company called Motive Base, and you can look it up, but they're indicating that actually the nutrition around protein is going is going to be the next wave. So people are going to be talking about the nutrition in proteins, not just protein in general. And I think collagen may have a tough time if that if that is in fact the case. All right. That was a really good question. <laughs> Some great responses. So our next one is, what are customers doing in out-of-stock situations for sports and nutrition supplements? So this is something that's been happening a lot, right? We go to the store and what we want isn't available. We're going to do a poll on this one and um, just launch the poll. So what happens when you go to the store or you go online and what you want what you normally buy isn't available. Do you try something else that's similar? Do you just go with a totally different product? Do you not buy anything? Um, obviously with COVID, this is something that we've all experienced, um, not just in sports and nutrition, but with all kinds of things not being available. All right, we've got almost we have another second here. Terrific. I'm going to share the results. So, Nikki, what do you think? Is this about what we saw? How do we reflect yeah. the, the Gen Pop survey that we did? Yeah, so we did a survey on this just recently. It was the first time we asked this question, and I, and I think it was a great question. What I found that was really interesting is this happened to 75% of consumers. Um, it looks like here that that's a, about the same. Yeah, actually it's exactly the same. So for 75% of people, this happened. Um, and most of them tried a different brand. Uh, we found that if you look at, um, sorry, let me do the quick math here. I thought I had this done. 55% uh, uh, actually tried something different. Um, of those who did try something new, 25% are going to stick with that new product. So that's great for, you know, for those companies who were, who were trying to maybe get in front of people and maybe they were in the corner or not the first thing to move. A lot of people maybe tried it and are using it now, but 36% um, percent are going to do both. So they'll work this new product into their rotation, um, but they won't exclusively buy it. I mean, overall, what this data sort of says says to me um, is that if you if you were a brand who might have been had trouble moving pre-pandemic, this could have been a great opportunity for for people to substitute with your product. And they might be trying it now when they wouldn't have before. So overall positive, I think, from that aspect. 
Yeah, right? and, and anecdotally, we're all dealing with this in some regard, and I had to deal with it uh, in a small case just with a, a pre-workout supplement. And I tried a different brand, which is uh, can be hard to do sometimes when you've got Old Faithful, uh, and it functioned well. I was lucky. Uh, I was a happy consumer. It worked well, and I, I might permanently switch, uh, which that option probably would not have, uh, that opportunity would not have come for that brand had I not lost access to the other one, likely due to demand or supply chain disruption. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, like you said, it's something we can all relate to. Um, so what functional food benefits are you seeing trending right now? I can I can kick off this one. It was one that I kind of teetered with back and forth um, when choosing my top three. But I think mental health um, in all aspects is something that's really trending right now. Um, you know, I think if you're at home, or our brains are doing different things. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people right now interested in mental health. I think there's probably a lot of interest or will be a lot of interest in sort of eye health, not only from e-gamers, but you know, also from people who are maybe in front of screens a lot more than they used to be, you know, maybe used to interact a lot more in the office with, you know, with your colleagues. And now you have to interact through a screen, uh, a screen and what does that mean um, for your for your eye health? So I think regardless of if you're working out or not, you're going to be you're going to be interested in mental health. But I think actually more specifically, if you were a performance athlete or, you know, focused on performance and active higher, if you look at the percentages of of consumers who are active, they would rate mental well-being just as important as physical well-being higher than you know the the gen pop. So I think that mental performance everywhere is is something that's that's a big trend right now. So kind of yeah. kind of keying into that mental health piece too. I see um, some interest in, in regards to people not thinking necessarily of themselves, but thinking of their children. So kids are kind of in two classifications right now. They're either 100% on their screen, uh, probably 10x what they were a year ago. And so there's concern about, again, their mental health, but then also the rest of their health because they're not as active and they're sitting still and they're on the screen, focused on the screen constantly. Um, and then the other half is these kids who are going back or in hybrid uh, versions, sometimes they're the most exposed, right? They're the most vulnerable. And those may be the ones that we're concerned about, you know, silently bringing this back into our household. So also just their general health. What can we do to keep them healthy so that they don't bring something back home with them? Because I've, I've seen a lot where, you know, it's the kids are more exposed than anybody else. And of course, you're the least in control of their day-to-day -day habits, right? You, you send them off to school in their mask and you hope that they wash their hands, but we all know that that's probably not at 100% compliant. So uh, both of those pieces I've seen where people are you know, trying to protect their kids in one um, and then protect them from the screen time as well, because that's definitely been a big shift right now. Yeah, I, I'll just add on the cognition, memory, um, even though we're maybe not living at quite as fast a pace overall, uh, there's still a lot going on at home with kids being there, having to go to school or not going to school, working in school from home. And um, consumers are really looking to get function out of their products and their foods. And uh, much of that seems to be around, uh, you know, cognition uh, and uh, nootropics uh, in that realm. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, with a shift, to move lifestyle fitness focus, how will the nutrition supplement market look in 2021? I mean, I these That's sort of future <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> these sort of future forward questions always make me a little bit a little I'm a little hesitant, but you know, I think from a lifestyle fitness perspective you know, my gut reaction to that is, you know, for the for the longest time, um, I think there was a, there was always a trend, not always, but recently there has been a trend toward lifestyle nutrition. Um, I was always really hesitant to talk about weight management because I didn't think that, you know, like it was more about a healthy lifestyle and, a, and an overall health versus, you know, slimming or losing weight. I didn't think that that had as much potential. 
But I do think that in the short term in 2021, you know, people have been maybe eating a little bit more biscuits. I don't know if I'm speaking for my, I, you know, I am speaking for myself here, but I think that actually coming into 2021, slimming might be something that it maybe is a little bit more powerful than, than I would have thought um, just because of the conditions that we've been under. Um, I think that that might be something, you know, um, that we could see a bit of a resurgence on. And that's just a hunch. Yeah, I don't think you're alone. I was just looking up the numbers on snack cake sales the other day, and <laughs> they're growing very well. <laughs> and, and people trying to, you know, some people finally you know, realizing that, you know, maybe they have had to put that pair of dress pants back on. They've been living in their <laughs> leggings all summer long, and now they kind of come come to that realization that I have to do something. You know, what what will make me feel full? What can can get me to kind of drop the COVID-20, right? And so we hear a lot around, you know, it was the freshman right. 10 and now it's the COVID-20. So so I, I think you're probably right in line See, with I that. I thought it was the COVID-15. Hopefully the whey protein will help. Maybe I need more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we got time for one more of right, these right. and then we're gonna uh, move to some live Q&A. So here's a big question. Um, is the trend of home workouts sustainable? And again, we're gonna, see um, what our collective intelligence here <laughs> says. We're opening a poll. Let me know what you think. Um, you know, when do you think we're going to be back in the gym? Um, are we going back to the gym? <laughs> How long will this trend continue? So this is a, this is a good question. This is what every, it's on everybody's mind, right? If we only had the crystal ball to know for sure, but um, All right, getting close Andrew, here. Laker, Moira, do you have the, the complete wording? It looks like we got cut off on that third um, third choice. The majority will only return part-time to the gym after? Um, I think after, sorry, after 2022, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I, yeah, that's right, Moira. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. All right, I'm sharing that our is results. Yeah. Here we are. So it looks like uh, we got some some majority be back by to the gym by 2022, and um, we'll only return. Yeah. So what do you think, Nikki? Yeah. So we do have some interesting results here. We, you know, we are asking the question not just are you working out at home or are you working out at doors, but you know, how are you maintaining your how are you maintaining your workout? And about nine percent of people in the latest survey indicated that they are going back to the gym. I think when I think back on the results, that that obviously, you know, in the beginning, I think we were around eleven or twelve percent in early pandemic. People, those hardcore gym guys, they were holding out. Um, but and then it crept back down, and now we're sort of seeing it, um, you know, creep back up to that about 10%. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, there, there, from my perspective, there's been a serious investment made in my house, I think in a lot of houses, um, and the investment behind that was, we're not going to pay for gem memberships anymore, how that's sort of how, you know, you can justify it. So, I mean, I think people have found that, it's it's more convenient if you're doing an exercise a class on demand if there are regimented people you can you can do it at 7 a.m you can do it at 6 a.m or you can do it on demand so it's a little bit more i think convenient so i think it i think it's sustainable just around you know just the way you're able to customize your customize your life now to what you have time for Absolutely. And I think from an online standpoint they've gotten much better at at kind of uh, replacing that camaraderie you know that piece where you're you are live and you're with other people and it's still your friends so i think that that's you know really changed recently yeah a real short answer, I'd, I'd agree as well i'd say that people have invested in their home gyms you know it takes what they say four months to build a habit we're not out of this yet i think when the gyms do reopen there'll be a more percentage than you might think that are going to stay back and then of course their supplementation will likely change to fit that that lifestyle adjustment yeah yeah i agree Good, so we are at the live Q&A section and um, I'm gonna let our panelists take a look at the questions here, but I just wanna also remind people that um, a recording of this event 
will be available tomorrow. And please watch your emails for some great additional content relating to today's topic that we'll be sending you. Um, and we're also going to be sending you a survey um, at the end of this webinar to give you a chance to give us some feedback on how we did today. So now to the live Q&A section. Yeah, so I did see I mean, a question I, here. Oh, go ahead, Nikki. Oh, you go ahead, Alice. Okay. I did see a question here that was really kind of, you know, if I'm summing it up right, was talking more about customized nutrition based on understanding people's genetic makeup. And that definitely was a trend that we were seeing before this happened. It may just be a little delayed now, but I don't think we're going to lose sight of that. I think that uh, the idea that people want to understand themselves much better uh, is still at, is still out there for sure. And then as we get more and more sophisticated with those tests and the information we can get from them, I do believe that the the consumer who's interested in that will want something very customized for them. Um, right now, the what's available is kind of like larger groups where you know you're kind of in a big sum group and and those are the supplements that are recommended to you but i have a feeling that's going to be broken down into much smaller categories eventually i don't see that going away yeah i would i would agree with alice on that a lot of you know personalization is um i i think you're seeing it a lot in supplements and and a lot of those supplement companies are becoming more sophisticated in um how they're personalizing things and, and I think genetics is, is as soon as they can scale and sort of get that moving it'll sports nutrition will be one of the first to sort of take off yeah and since that is so new uh, brands are are optimizing that system and they're going to continue to optimize that and it's going to become more uh, it's going to become a lot easier to supply to consumers because it was kind of it's kind of fresh off the press really the personalized nutrition um, market um, I'll jump on one more here before we go. I know we only have a couple more minutes. It said, apart from protein bars and vitamin supplements, what are other trends for dietary supplements? Um, functional foods are making a huge push. Um, you can think outside of the box from a protein bar, a cookie. Now we're looking at uh, fortified snacks and treats, uh, things that would not commonly cereal, magic spoon, for example. Carmen, I think we lost um, making your making a huge press in the market to to gobble up consumers who want to find different ways. Did you lose me? We lost you, but you're back. How about so now? You're back. Yep, we got you. Any luck? Okay, you can hear me now. Uh, yep. Long story short, functional foods, uh, snacks, treats, different uh, applications are becoming huge. And I'll pass it on so somebody can else answer before this is over. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Corbin. We we have seen in some of the data that we've done just, you know, I, I think <clears throat> sometimes we tend to generalize and talk about RTDs, um, RTMs and, and bars, but there is just when you ask consumers, where are you getting protein fortified foods that, you know, that just blows up, you know, people are looking for cookies, they're looking for waffles and pancakes. So I just think that, um, you know, while we may be focused on those things, they're, they're, is a massive opportunity and consumers are looking for those things like cereal. Um, I would agree, yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, we got a lot of good questions here. We're gonna try to follow up maybe afterwards with some emails as well, because, um, you know, fortunately we've run out of time. Um, for those of you who wanna hang on, I don't know, do you wanna pick one more question to answer? Um, are we good? I, I have a I have a few great questions that I don't have the answers to right now, but I, I want to follow <laughs> up with them and and make yeah. sure I get them because they're great questions. So I I don't want to um, a lot of questions around price points that I I don't have the the answers to, but I'm I'm hoping to get them to people. So yeah yeah absolutely I think that's good. We'll follow up then with some emails and thank you everyone so much for joining us and again. Um, if you can give us your feedback in the post webinar survey, that would be great. And watch your emails because we're going to be sending you some other good content related to this topic for today. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.